Okay, welcome to Kate's story today. She is here to talk about her uh, NL Reads nominated book, Urchin. It's uh, one of my favorite books of the year. I'm going to say that about all the books, but it's always true. Um, and Kate's here to talk to us today about her book, about her writing life, and a little bit about herself. Hi, Kate. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, if we want to just dive right in, um, what would you say the best part of writing a book is? For me, uh, you know, maybe like as with any job, the best part is when it's going well. So there's like, I think most writers would agree, there's, there's a, there's a, there are times when you're writing when you really feel like you're in the flow and you feel like you're discovering something that's already there and the characters are really speaking to you. There's a lot of momentum, you lose track of time. Uh, and it all just floods out of you and, and just feels terrific. Uh, so that's probably, you know, obviously the best part of writing. Um, I would add though that, that uh, you know, when I look back at the drafts, there isn't actually much difference in quality between my writing that I do in that kind of state and the writing I do when I'm just dragging every word out of myself. So I've learned like, you know, the only way out is through, but uh, of course it's just wonderful when you have that feeling of being in the flow. That's just a great experience. Great. Um, if you were to use a nom de plume, what would it be? I thought about that question and I just, I just keep coming back to my name already sounds like a nom de plume. And uh, uh, I don't think, I just don't want one. <laughs> I, don't want, <laughs> I don't want a nom de plume. I mean, my own name is it, it, almost ridiculous for a writer because, you know, my last name is Story, S-P-O-R-Y. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've, I've been teased a lot about that over the years. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I'm used to it. Maybe I'm just used to it. I, I, it's my name that was given to me by my parents. I did nothing to achieve the name, uh, but I, I'm used to it. And I, I don't know. I'm quite fond of it. That's a cool name. I like it too. Oh, thank you. What was the first story you ever wrote? Well, actually it was a, a humorous memoir piece in grade seven. I wrote uh, uh, about the first day at United Junior High, which is where I went to uh, at, uh, junior high school. And uh, it won a contest actually um, and got read on local CBC, It was super uh, exciting and heady. And the other reason it was exciting was, um, I mean, I basically just wrote about what my first day in you know, junior high was like, and uh, it was quite uh, frightening and, and baffling in a lot of ways. But I, I wrote about it, uh, tried to make it a funny story. And when the teacher, oh my God, it was so awful. She said, I'm going to read it out loud. And I didn't know whether <laughs> she was, she was going to read it out to the class because it was so bad. And she was just gonna, that was it. I was mm -hmm. hung, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, she read it out and the class, like, they just about died laughing. They they thought it was funny too. So, <laughs> so that was a good experience. Uh, and then I didn't write for a long time after that. I, I don't know if my early success <laughs> uh, <laughs> ruined me, but uh, yeah, no, I just, it paralyzed me actually. Cause I was like, oh my God, that story won a little contest, whatever the contest was. Got read on CBC and I never wrote anything again until I was in my twenties. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Another way. <laughs> um, if you could meet your characters, what would you say to them? Honestly, I think I'd be more interested in what they would say to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I know they're not real people. I <laughs> I know the difference between fact and fiction. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I I think honestly, I don't have anything I want to say to them. I, I'd really love to hear what they would say. Boy, you really got that wrong story. You missed that or. <laughs> Uh, or they might have advice. <laughs> I'm always looking life advice. Sure, you know, fictional character. Why not? You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. A lot of my characters have a lot to say, and the ones who don't. Uh, oh, I'd love if they had something to say to me. Nanny King say an urchin loved an urchin. Mm. Say. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I was talking to uh, Mado, who is advocating for your book, just yesterday, and we were both saying about how how Dora is the kind of character that lives in your head for a long time. So we we nice. we. They're real to us too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> now, if it's time to make the movie of your book, which would be awesome, um, who would you cast if you could cast anybody? Oh, it would be awesome, actually. I have quite a visual mind, you know. I'm always picturing things. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. I keep coming back to, like, I mean, on one level, and now she's way too old now, but uh, I think her name's Maisie Williams. She's in Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. She played the young. Oh, yeah. 
uh, this is embarrassing. All the Game of Thrones people out there are just now throwing me off a cliff. I'm being de defenestrated right now. But uh, I think her the actor's name is Maisie Williams. When she was young, you know, when Game of Thrones mm -hmm. started. It's kind of how I pictured Dora in a way. But I have to tell you, I would want to cast Newfoundlanders. We have so many mm -hmm. wonderful actors. And uh, let's, just, let's just cast the piece with Newfoundlanders, with the exception of Marconi, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, we, can, have to get <laughs> we can actually cast somebody whose mother is Anglo- Anglo Irish and fathers of Italian. No, that's not necessary. People can act, but yeah, no, there's right. so many wonderful, wonderful, wonderful actors uh, back home. And I, I just think, yeah, cast it with Newfoundlanders, Newfoundland Labradorians. Fun. Yes. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is your favorite book or would you like to tell us a book you're, about a book you're reading now? I mean, I've, I'm one of these people, I can never say what my favorite book is. Mm -hmm. You know, I love so many books and so many That's authors. Right. Secondary question there. <laughs> yeah, so many. Oh, my goodness. But, um, you know, the book I just finished, uh, this is, oh, my God, this can make me sound like such a geek. All right. It's called The Lodger, Shakespeare and Silver Street. I'm sorry. I really loved it. I loved it. I loved it. By this guy's Charles Nichols. He's uh, some Brit. Um, and he, mm -hmm. he knows more about, well, that I've encountered that uh, period of uh, theater in London. And uh, for me, this book brought this sort of context to life. Um, I've always been a huge Shakespeare fan. I, I really enjoy the plays. I, I, I've, I've directed Shakespeare. I've been in Shakespeare and I, I read it. I like it. Although I don't actually enjoy reading it all that much. It's not really meant to be read. But uh, just the context of him, just the, the bloody business of making theater and what's it, what's it like to live and die in, in, in Jacobean London and uh, uh, what the people were like, what things probably smelled and sounded like. Uh, and yeah, just what his rivals, his compatriots, you know, his colleagues, uh, the financial pressures of keeping a theater open, all that stuff. Great book, The Lodger. Yeah, thought it was great. Yeah. Now, if you could have anyone to your book club, living or dead, who would you invite? Well, my mother, Alice Story, uh, passed away a number of years ago, but she had a, a book club and they ended up calling it the No Book Book Club because, because <laughs> they realized what they found. These are like some of the smartest women on earth, some of the smartest people on earth. And what they found was they would get together and then they rarely spoke about the book. They would just talk, right? And then, then they got to the point and some of them just weren't getting around to reading the books. So then they thought, well, we'll, we'll watch the movie version of whatever book, if there was one. But they still just, they didn't even watch the movie. They would just talk. So I actually think it's about talk. I mean, yes, I think book clubs are incredible. I, I've actually gone as an author to, to book clubs and they've discussed my book and and uh, just some of the smartest people, my goodness, and some of the, the comments. I just love it, uh, the insights that people have. So I think it's about talk, though. So I was thinking, like, who would, who would I just like to have in a room together? And I came up with a bit of a list. But it's like, I mean, basically, it's like a kitchen party. And who do you want to, you know, and it's like all my friends. So I le unfortunately left my friends out of this. But just, you know, if we're talking mm -hmm. about celebrities here. Selma Hayek, I always thought she's a really interesting person. Kate Blanchett, who wouldn't want to know what she thinks? Annie Lennox. Josephine <laughs> Baker, I, I would love to know what she has to say about the world. Uh, Cherish Violet Blood, living, uh, wonderful actor I know. Bloodfoot uh, actor, she was just in that, uh, that movie Scarborough, was doing very well. And she's like amazing, really fun. Uh, Jane Austen, why not? Mary Shelley, I think she's terrific. Uh, Shakespeare, yeah, sure. That would be interesting. Let one fella in. Shakespeare, he's allowed. Yeah, that's my list. <laughs> that's a pretty impressive list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I just think it would be very interesting conversations. Of course, yeah. yeah. Different, different viewpoints. Um, also, everybody, been... everybody's very, very good looking, with the exception possibly of Shakespeare. We're not sure. But mm -hmm. all those people are very, very, very good looking. It, so would, that make, would... it would make for some great Instagram, yeah. I sure. think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I could just, you know, think of beauty as a joy forever and, you know. Absolutely. There we go. Um, who has been your biggest supporter? Well, see if I can get through this without crying. Uh, I would say in terms of my writing, uh, I've had so many uh, people support me. So honestly, uh, like every book is, is, I mean, in the end, you know, if you really trace it back, hundreds of people go into it. Uh, and I think my my sort of acknowledgments at the end of Urchin are almost as long as Urchin. Uh, and I mean it, you know. But I would say, like, if I have to really narrow it down, there's, I'm going to go to two. So I have to acknowledge, of course, Mar Marnie Parsons of Running the Goat Books and Broadsides. Urchin exists because of Marnie. And we met, she was actually the editor of my first two novels uh, when Killick Press was still a thing. 
and uh, she was an editor and that's how we met and we just always bonded and got along and and then she actually more or less commissioned urchin from me and so i mean my goodness what an experience and and, and what an honor um and she's just wonderful and i don't really know how she does everything she does at running the goat i just don't um i worry about her on a daily basis and she's just <laughs> she's just marvelous she's the best friend a writer could have and i guess the other person is my my partner uh ryan kerr uh I sort of did a nice tour of maybe some not very great partners for, for a long time. And I learned that it's good to have somebody who has your back. See, mm. that's, that's some <laughs> relationship advice that other people probably don't need. But I needed that. Don't go out with people who sabotage everything you do or just go like, you know, I'd have I have I tend to have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of ideas. And and my other partners were always their, their impulse was always no, 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 don't do that. Why would you do that? You know, and Ryan's always like, mm, okay, you know, like he just doesn't say no. Now I know that doesn't sound great. He doesn't say no, and then he says yes, and then he helps me. He's got my back. That's wonderful. It is That's wonderful. Cool. I'm not trying to be smug about that. No, uh, it's work. Obviously, you know, relationships are work, but that's it. That's the key to a successful relationship. You have each other's <laughs> backs. You know. Wonderful. Yeah. Love it. Um. So, what does the title urchin mean to you? And did you consider any other titles while you were working on this? I, I definitely did. And I, I got to credit uh, Charlie Petch, my friend Charlie Petch, who's a transmasculine uh, poet, wonderful person, hilarious, uh, and also was a was a reader on this this book. Um, so I, I was just calling, I call it like, you know, sometimes I'll just call it door or I was calling it jack of spades, you know, and then I was calling it toad astray, T-O-W-E-D, astray. But then that was pointed out, it sounds like toad, like as in toad of toad hall, toad. Mm -hmm. And also uh, was kind of close to another running the goat, the title of another running the goat book that had just come out a year or two before. And uh, so, you know, I was kind of dithering about what to call it. And Charlie suggested urchin and... And then I loved it immediately. I'd already described Dora as an urchin. That was already mm -hmm. in the writing. And I myself, I'm sort of obsessed with sea urchins, always have been. I just think they're gorgeous and uh, kind of interesting creatures. And uh, a big part of my childhood and you know, growing up was you know, whenever we go to like Horse Cove or Beach in Middle Cove, collecting, of course, those little tests, right? They're just gorgeous. And mm -hmm. um, but urchin is usually, when I looked it up, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, urchin. You already had people yelling, you know, adults yelling at door, calling, calling them an urchin. And then, but it usually means for a, a boy child. You'd usually call a boy an urchin, actually. And I was like, oh, that's true. And uh, then I thought, you know, that's kind of telling because it means that these adults calling door an urchin are already picking up on something about door, right. uh, whether they know it or not, that there's something not quite just fully girlish about door. There's, there's some other gender queerness going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and her gender isn't as binary as maybe some others. So uh, it means a lot to me. It means both those sea creatures, uh, you know, that kind of thing, the mysteriousness of these, these, these creatures, who, when you look at them, I, uh, you know, you'd have to, I don't know how you would tell, you know, I mean, I, I think urchins <laughs> even have a sex, but I don't know, if, I'm not even positive about that, uh, how they reproduce. I, I can't tell looking at them. And then for Dora, I thought that would be significant. And then just, yeah, just being called a dirty urchin, little urchin, you know, all that kind of stuff uh, was period appropriate, but also really seemed to work for her. Right, that's for so them. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Last question. What was your favorite book as a child? Uh, geek alert. Yeah. So Lord of the Rings, sorry, just was Lord of the Rings. Loved it. Read it. <laughs> end to end a million times. Couldn't get enough of it. Read it over and over again. My, my relationship to the book changed as I got older. When I was little, uh, I first read it, I was 10. So probably a bit young for it, mm. but I loved it. I mean, I'd read The Hobbit. And I just really liked all the Hobbit stuff. <laughs> and I remember I skipped it. There's all that, that stuff when, with the humans and the battles. And there's a lot of, and low, you know, that starts happening. So when I was younger, I, I kind of skip over those parts a bit. Or I'd read them and be like, okay, let's get back to the Hobbits. And then as I got older, of course, I got really into uh, more of the human and elven kind of politics, you know, and the war and what that meant. Uh, and as, uh, Eowyn, you know, became a more interesting character to me as a teenager who uh, cross-dresses in order to go to war. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, as I got older still, uh, I got really interested in its relationship to Tolkien's, uh, the fact that he, he served in World War, World War I. Those swamps of the dead, uh, Mordor, 
Uh, and then recently, too, I actually started uh, doing my own explorations of Beowulf, and he was obsessed with Beowulf. And uh, now, of course, I see, wow, it's so Beowulf. So it, my relationship with this book keeps changing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, starting when I was 10, I just was obsessed with it, honest to God. I, I read it, and I would get to the end of it, and then I'd go back to page one of book one and start it again. And I did that for years. I would read other books in between. Mm -hmm. but it was like wrenching away from my favorite text. Yeah. <laughs> Total geek alert. Yep. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. I love it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for talking with me today. Um, Urchin is a fantastic book. We all love it here. We're so excited to feature you as one of our NL Reads shortlisted books and shortlisted authors. And I hope everyone gets a chance to read it. Thank you well, so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor uh, to be part of this. I, I'm, I'm just, I can't even get over it. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm.